<laughs> Ash. So God created everything that was needed in the God, you know, in the earth in order that when the human race came on the scene, talking about in the garden initially and then for the rest of the earth, there is nothing that we need that cannot be found here on the earth. We didn't need technology. We didn't need a city because there was already air. There was water. There was food. Everything that we possibly needed, God created in great detail. So, what I'm saying to you is we can lack nothing here on the earth. There is nothing that we can lack. Amen? The blessing of God is comprehensive. It covers all areas of our life. It covers the physical, the spiritual, the emotional, the financial, the personal, and the material. Hallelujah. In 3 John 2, it says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. Praise be to God. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says, Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Joshua chapter 1 verses 8 says, Do not let the book of the Lord depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. And then you shall be prosperous and have good success. And then in Philippians 4.19 it says, And my God will meet all of your needs according to his reach. In Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, the power is in the cross. The Lord Jesus Christ, through Christ, God has supplied everything that we need. Everything. So there's nothing that we can face on the earth today that can separate us from God's love, that can separate us from God's um, resources, there's nothing that separates us from accessing that. But it is important that we keep our heart right. We cannot become indifferent to the things of God. We have to seek the kingdom. Like during the prayer meeting, we said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. First, the kingdom is in me. Then the kingdom is in my family. And then the kingdom is in everything else that I do. But we can't let the kingdom be in everything that we do if the kingdom is not in my mind and in my heart. Because if it's not in my mind and my heart, how do I effect change in my household? And then how do I effect change openly? It may work for a while in a form of godliness, but then it will always be tripped up by our human nature because our human nature will always get the best of us when the chips are down and they're in our face and they're criticizing us and they're fighting us and they're warring against us. But it takes a man and a woman of God to do all that he needs to do and then to stand in the confidence by faith that God will do everything that he said he will do and he will give you the victory. Now, if we look at Abel, Abel gave an offering. My question is, as the first recorded offering, why is it being spoken about even today? What made his offering so special that even his brother was prepared to kill him because of that? He was jealous. Abel gave as an act of his own will. Abel didn't give it out of duty. Abel didn't give it out of obligation. Abel gave it out of his own free will because he loved God. Abel did not give just a good offering. He gave an offering that was unequal to every other person on the face of the earth at the time. 
He gave a sacrifice. It means he, it cost him something. What made that offering so important, brothers and sisters? Mm. His offering even speaks after his very death. In Proverbs chapter 10, it says, The memory of the righteous will be a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. The thing that made Abel's testimony immortal was the kind of offering that he gave. We, as a body of Christ, must be prepared to give our very best offering unto the Lord. I often speak about Abraham and how God had told him to sacrifice his son. Because his son was a gift. He waited many, many years, almost a hundred years before he had his child. And then the Lord gave it to him. And then the Lord said to him, I want you to sacrifice your own very, your very own son. Sometimes the Lord, we wait a long time to get to a certain place in our lives and God blesses us with certain things. And then the Lord turns around and says, no, it's now time for you to give this thing away. He comes and he says, Wesley, it's time to sacrifice Isaac. And then along this journey, I'm weighing up the options. What are the pros and cons? <laughs> what is it that I want to give? Should I give something else? Is there something else that I can give that would match the value of Isaac? Is there something that I can give that God would accept because I really love Isaac? But then just the very thought of that disqualifies us because we're more concerned with the creation than the creator. And I think for a lot of people in the body of Christ, that is one of the reasons why we find an excuse as to why we cannot do what we need to do in the house of the Lord because we love Isaac. Brothers and sisters, God is a creator. He would give you 10 Isaacs if you asked him to. But the one that you love is the one that he's requiring. God requires your life. I have been in the position many times where I had to give up Isaac. And no matter how you wrestle, you know at the end of the day, <laughs> Isaac has to be given. And then you take him to the altar and the Lord provides for himself a lamb. What is your Isaac today that we need to sacrifice? The offering, a mirror to the soul. 1, Chron 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 17 says, I know, my God, that you test my heart and are, ple and are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent, and now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. David and the people of Israel had managed to gather a vast fortune for the construction of God's temple offering. Brothers and sisters, think about that. 400 years of slavery. 400 years of slavery. Apartheid lasted how long? 400 years. Yet when they left Egypt, and when they were building the temple, they had amassed large, I mean, vast wealth. Where did it come from? It's a blessing of the Lord. I mean, it's not like they could create some economic ecosystem in the desert. They were in the desert. They had a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They didn't even have the means to feed themselves. God sent manna from heaven. And then I'll go back to my point I gave last week. I said, 
Prosperity is not having millions in the bank. Prosperity is having today's needs met today. So whether I have, I praise God. Whether I don't have, I praise God. Because he wants us to keep him at the forefront of our mind and not the circumstance. The scripture goes that you cannot serve two masters. We cannot serve the God of money and then serve the Lord Jesus Christ. If we serve the Lord Jesus Christ, he will give us everything that we need for this life. But if we serve money, money will always tell you I'm never enough. Because the minute everything, we're living in a consumer-driven society, everything is about the next big thing, having this piece of technology, driving this car. If you don't do this, you'll never get that. And you don't do that, you'll never have this status and this and that. And it goes on and on and on. It is greedy. It is self-serving. It sucks the very life out of you. Our entire system is created to suck the very life out of us. But if we put God in the rightful place of our lives, I promise you, brothers and sisters, God will supply all that we need. There is nothing that we can face in this life that He will not fix. First fruits offering, as much as it is about giving, first fruits offering is also about letting go. We've got to let go of Isaac. But also, also, it's about letting go of things that people owe us. Letting go of things that have kept us mentally in prison for so many years. I am what I am because of so and so and so and so and so and so. And they did what they did and this is the state of me because of this and because of that and so on and so forth. First fruits is also letting it go. Sometimes you actually have to sow a seed and then you write a little letter. Dear God, Father, forgive me for holding on to this thing for so long. I'm so sorry. I have held Bob accountable for something that I should have let go a long time ago. I've allowed it to hinder my prosperity. I've allowed it to completely destroy my life. But today, Lord God, as I sow the seed, I write this letter to you in love and I say, Father, I forgive Bob. He owes me no money. Father, I hand this debt over to you. I release it from today. I will never touch this thing again. I will never allow this to be my blessing blocker. Signed, close that envelope, sow that seed. <laughs> That's a tough cookie. I remember... Just after getting married, I was going through something very difficult at the time. And I sat down with my father the one day because this thing was really eating at me. I didn't do anything wrong, but I just had a lot of money that was owing. And it just, there was no way. There was just no way that I could foreseeably see this money coming back to me. And my father said, you need to let it go, son. You know, when you're angry and when you want what you want, and even though you know it's right, but you've got to let it go, that's when we retaliate. And we're talking so many moons ago, all right? But those words, they sunk in. It took a couple of days and I said, okay, I'm going to let this thing go. So I took a thousand rand. Because there was literally every cent that I had. I took it and I wrote this Dear God letter. You know the Dear John letter? Remember there's a phone called Dear John. Yeah, so I wrote a Dear John letter to God. And I said, Lord, I release this from today. When I released that and it left my hand, it put me, my heart, my mind at peace. 
It took more than five years for that to be settled and dealt with and all that. And really, I never even rocked up for the court case. Couldn't care less. I never even went. Did the money come back into my hand? No. But I was released from that thing. But if I look at my life today, I thank God that he put me in a position that I, I was able to let it go. What is holding us back, brothers and sisters, from experiencing the beauty that God has for us today? We have to let it go. I'm dealing with a situation now, and already a week ago, the Lord said to me, this is what I want you to do. I already knew that I got to let this thing go. But not because I was right or I was wrong or whatever the case. It had nothing to do with people. It was just, you know, circumstance. And I had to let go of a lot of money. A lot of money. And I said, Lord, that's what you want from me. That's what I'm going to do. So I wrote another Dear John letter. <laughs> and I wrote there exactly what it was, and I released it. And you know what that did to me? That released me from that situation. It put me in a place where I know, God, you did that once before. You will do it again. I know that with you, I cannot lose. I don't put my trust in people. I put my trust in God. And you know what? As far as I'm concerned, God's already released me. God has already released me because I've done it in faith. I didn't do it because I was angry or I didn't do it grudgingly. I did it in the confidence, the fact that, Lord, you've done it for me before. You will do it again. I release myself from this thing. And I praise God, God will give me the victory just like he's given it to me before. First fruits is about giving, but first fruits is also about letting go. You know, in, uh, in Hebrew culture, they said once every five years, was it once every seven years, they release debt. Every seven years, they release debt. How long are we holding on to that? Ah, you know, Bobby owes me a hundred bucks. I've been waiting for that money. Somebody took your Tupperwares. You're still waiting for it to return back to the house. <laughs> you got to release those Tupperwares. <laughs> now I'm making it light. But you know, some, some of those things, they hold us back, eh? And they poison us so deeply. But we got to let those things go. We got to let it go. Because if you don't let it go, it's going to eat the very life, the very joy, the very peace. I mean, we're even losing sleep over it. Our blood pressure is going up because we're holding on to this thing. It's manifesting in our body with a skin condition because we're holding on to something that God wanted us to let go of. So the offering is the mirror of the soul. So that offering is not always just about you giving money, 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 money. That's what I want. That's what I want. No. We do it because we love the Lord, because we trust in His divine sovereignty. We're saying, Lord, you will take care of everything. Hallelujah. I give you my health. It's yours. I give you my children. It's yours. I give you my wife, my husband, because Lord, you know. I give them to you. Lord, my job, I give it to you. Lord, my finances, I give it to you. Lord, my mother, my father, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, my cousins, my whatever, I, I give it to you. I'm, I've, I've had enough. I refuse to be God in my life anymore. So there is also an offering unto the Lord. That's what the Bible say. That bring it to me. And take on my burden. Because my burden is light. So brothers and sisters, let it go. Forget about it. Yes. Hallelujah. Oh. Yes. 
Hebrews chapter 7 verses 2. It is normal for the people of Israel to separate the tenth part of the income for the work of the Lord, even before he established the Mosaic law. Abraham gave a tenth of everything Melchizedek who blessed him. But then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and, I, and will watch over me on the journey I am taking, and I will give you an will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house. Then the Lord will be my God and the stone that I've set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of that all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. And then Malachi, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord God Almighty. And see if I will be if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out such a blessing that it will you will not have enough room for any of it. And I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. Hear me. And the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed. For yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord God Almighty. Brothers and sisters, if God provides everything that we need today and the prosperity means that we are meeting every single need today, is that not a miracle in itself? Because once upon a time I needed this and God provided after a while. And once upon a time I needed that. And then after a while God provided. And my child needed this and my child needed that. And then after a while the Lord provided. And as I was being built in my faith. And as I was walking along life's journey. The Lord was walking with me. But as I grew in my faith. Is it not a miracle that God has given you the ability to bring that resource and that sustenance out of your own hand? Let me say it another way. Is it not amazing that you didn't need to come to the church to be delivered from some form of sickness and disease because the miracle is that you're living in divine health each and every day. Is that not a miracle? It's not about running around the church to and fro talking about this and that, and that is wonderful. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. I am a child that is a miracle on its own. I am a child of being a miracle on its own. Right, you'll have heard the testimonies many times over. But isn't it a miracle that you are living in a perpetual form of blessing and increase and prosperity in every area of your life? Is that not a miracle on its own? The fact that once upon a time you were in the, the worst form of life and God picked you out of that. Now today you find yourself in a place of notoriety and influence. Is it not a miracle that God has kept you there? Because we are people focused on our creator rather than the creation. You see, when you're a person that's focused on the creation, uh, on the creation, the thing that's being created, what happens is that that is something that can be taken away, that's something that can, you know, falls away, something gets old, something, they, you know, Something happens along the way, but when you focus on the Creator, even that very thing that you have, God maintains, He restores, He fixes, you know, the canker worm, the palm worm, they can't take it. And even if it was taken in a way, you still didn't lose because you were following the Creator, so He gives you something even better. Is that not a miracle in itself? So that's why when it comes to when it comes to us as the believers. Our heart attitude before God is of the utmost.
utmost importance, not prosperity. Because prosperity is a byproduct of having that wonderful, deep relationship with Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, I want to share a testimony just before I close. Now, we're coming to the end of the service, but the principle of the first fruits in my own life is something that I saw my parents practice, and it is something that Yajna and I have practiced even from the time that we've been married. All right? Now, I'm not saying this is how you should do it, but I'm telling you how we do it. Okay? It's a bit extreme for some, but I understand it's okay. It's, it's a walk of faith. It's a, it's a journey. It's a process. But Yajna and I, from the very first time, for example, if, if you know, when we were trusting God for something and then God gave it, the very thing that was given, for example, the very first job that Yajna got, the very first job that Yajna got when we first got married, okay, many moons ago now. The very first time the salary hit her account, she gave the entire salary. And do you know what? From that time to now, we still practice. Because that was the very best of what was given at the time. The entire salary. Did we need the money? Oh, yes, we needed the money. We don't have enough time to talk about all the things that we were going through at the time, but we needed the money. But that was a principle that we maintained. Do you know Yajna over the last 20 years has had, I think, about nine different promotions? And do you know that was even with just a metric? And do you know that she is actually now being trained to be the VP of the company with the metric? And now she, yes, the degree. Oh, yeah, last year she got the degree finally. That's a conversation for another time. But remember, the, uh, but understand the value was not in the qualification. The value was in the creator. Hear me, hear me. Qualification has a purpose, plan, and I encourage every single young person that's sitting here, don't think that it's going to fall on your lap. It's not. You're going to have to work for it. Okay? I don't care who you are. That's something you need to work for. But your focus must not be on that degree. Because let me tell you, the value is in the Creator. Because God brings to the table what the degree can never. Because the degree doesn't give you the job. It only gives you a little bit of a boost. A little bit of boost gives you something, uh, an, an advantage, an edge over something. Because if that were the case, every doctor, every lawyer... Every accountant should be in a place of government, should be prosperous. Every lecturer in the university should be running the government, right? They should be the people that should be having the Fortune 500 companies. They should be the people that everybody looks to to say, wow, this is the way, this is the truth, this is the life, but it's not. But God is. Understand, we can have our children going to the very best schools. We can have them going to the very best universities. But if there's no God in this heart, there's no guarantee that they're going to be a success in life. And there's no guarantee that every investment that you made into their child, is going, there's going to be a return on that investment. And it does not guarantee that your grandchildren will enjoy the fruit of your labor because you don't know whether their child is going to squander everything that you gave them. But with God, when your life is in a place where God is the center of your life, I guarantee you, your God will be the center of your child's life. And your child, when they get married, their 
children will know God as the center of their life. Because that is the legacy that we should be looking at. Not the legacy of money, not the legacy of things. The value as Christians that we have is what we have through Christ Jesus. You know what I stand on? I stand on the fact, and this is just for me personally, I stand on the fact that when my parents, my mother was a Muslim, my father was a Hindu, you all know the story, God put them together, they became Christians. I have lived the life where they have put everything in God. And I am a product of them putting everything in God. Now Stephanie and Robin know that when there's something to do, when there's something that's in need, there's something, who is the first and foremost? It's God. So guess what? One day when they have children, whether, whether we will be around or not, it'll make no difference. But God will be the center there and God will take them forward. I, I bless the Lord for the fact that he took them out of squalor and he placed them in a place of notoriety and influence. And God gave them so much and God blessed them so much. And because of that blessing, I am blessed so much and so on and so forth. And Stephanie and Robin will be blessed so much. And those grandchildren, as they come, they will be blessed so much. Why? Because the legacy is in Christ Jesus. So brothers and sisters, when you go home today, you go, you lay hands on those kids. You go, you lay hands on your home. You go lay hands on the situations. You go lay hands. And together as a family, you'll make a decision that today is the last day where I'm going to look at the creation. I'm going to look at the creator. It doesn't matter if it's butter bread on the table or if it's lamb or if it's, you know, Wagyu steak. It makes no difference. Because if God is God, God will take care of everything. God will take care of everything. We look at the Apostle Paul. We look at the, at the, at the disciples. We look at, at the, the apostles. We look at, at the men through the ages. Talking about the Old Testament into the New Testament. The ones that kept God as God are the ones that found the deliverance. Are the ones that found the healing are the ones that found the great value, the secrets that are being kept. They found all of that through the Holy Spirit, but they had to dig into the things of God. They had to dig in. Don't ever look at what's in the pocket and say, hey, you know, I'm going to give the house a load. We're going to spur for lunch. What are we doing? I'm going, no, sorry. I'm going to rock on mamas because I need some chicken wings. Or hey, I can give to the house of the Lord. I can eat the seed or I can sow the seed. You know? I can look at it that way. The money comes into the bank end of the month. And I look, hey, yo, I got hmm, 50,000 rand. I got 51,000 rand in bills. Hey, I didn't even pay my tithes yet. No, it's fine. God will forgive me. It's okay. I'll pay the bills. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you. You give the 10%, all right? But what's left is far more protected than paying the bill. Because God brings money from everywhere. God brings money from everywhere. When you put the seed in the ground like Abel did, even after you did, your seed is echoing through the ages. It's echoing through your generations. It's echoing into eternity. I was saying to a young man a couple of weeks ago, you know, I said to him, you know, you need to get your, your house in order and so on and so forth. And I was sharing some stuff with him. I said, you know, when a father is not in the house and he's working, I said, the authority of the father is echoing through the house, even when he's not there. In other words, the child waking up, making sure he cleans the room, you know, puts the, the washing into the basket and taking the dishes to the sink and whatever it may be, you know, just general chores, just this, that, and the other. Then it even changes when the, when the child wants a tattoo. Then 
they know exactly what the father said. So even when the father is not there, it's the uh, you know the father's voice is echoing in the child's yeah. That if you do this, I'm gonna kill you. You know, but remember, it's the authority of the father. My question is, when God spoke and He gave us the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have the Gospels. And when that's echoing in our heart, that's echoing in our lives. And when we put seeds in the ground and we live a life for God, it echoes through the generation. Far beyond. So even one day, we'll go on to be with the Lord and your child is now an adult. And now they've got children and then those children now are on the verge of having their own children, your words will be in their hearts and in their minds. Why? Because your legacy that you left for them was gone. My dad taught me that we lay hands. My dad taught me that we do this. My dad taught me that we do that. What is it that you want echoing through your generations? With our seed, with our mouth, with our words, with our life. That truly is the first fruit. Amen? Come on, let's stand to our feet. You know, Robert likes to take advantage. So Robert loves PlayStation, right? So every now and again, I'll go home, you know, I'm working and, and I'll go out and then I'll say to... Um, I'll say to Robin, I said, Robin, by this time, I want that thing off. And I want you doing this, 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 this. <laughs> and there come that time. Already his sister is reminding him, hey, dad said by this time. Robin already puts an alarm. So the minute it goes. So the first thing he does before he puts the thing off, he peeps outside to see if I'm in the house. Stephanie, is dad's car here? Okay. Is mom there? Mom, I love you. Just to test, test the temperature, you know, to see how it is. You all know how the kids are, right? But the fact that it's echoing in his ear, the thing needed to be off now. When Robin is dealing with something or, you know, there's some difficulty somewhere or something, and then he'll phone me and he'll say, Dad... Um, you know, I need to tell you something, but you can't get upset with me or, you know, whatever the case is. I said, son, before you tell me, I said, what did dad say you must do? Then Robin will turn around and say, no, you need to put it. I need to tell Jesus. I said, yes, good. I said, did you tell Jesus? Uh, he goes, um, I was waiting for you. I said, okay, fine. I said, let's take it to Jesus. So then, even though Robin's vocabulary is limited, but I'll say, okay, now you go and you say it. Daddy will stand here and I'll listen to you and we'll agree together, Jesus will fix it. And he does it. And in his own words, that child gets what he wants. That child gets what he wants. We marvel at it. I'm telling you. We marvel at it. Brothers and sisters, don't ever count what's in your hand because your life has far more value than that thing in your hand. Even when the disciples, you man, they were going out fishing, they couldn't catch anything, Jesus came on the scene, they went out, they couldn't even, I mean, their nets were breaking, the boats were almost capsizing and they came off from there. They didn't say, okay, I need to buy a bigger ship. They turned around and said, Lord, you are the Christ. And they left everything where it was and they followed him. Because they realized he was the creator. Brothers and sisters, God did not bless us for us to have a new car every five days. And for us to have a house in every city in the world. And for us to just live a life outside of Jesus. Jesus has given us a life of prosperity to prove to you that he is God. Now he's expecting us to turn around and to do 
his work, his will, his way. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that was an indicator to you that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody can come to the Father except through Jesus. So brothers and sisters, as I close the meeting today, know that there's nothing that we can give, nothing that we can that will remove us from the will of God. It is us giving, and that puts us in the will of the Father. So whether you've done your first fruits already, whether you're thinking about it, whether you're contemplating it, it makes no difference. But when you look at my father, when you look at my mother, you look at Yajna, you look at myself, you look at our family, you look at all around, I'm telling you, we are the products of Jesus. We are the products of a life of sowing. We are a product of a life of giving. We are a product. And you know what? There are seasons for everything. There are seasons for everything. Just because you're going through a season of difficulty doesn't mean that you did necessarily something wrong. Not everything is a punishment. Because yes, we were led to believe that, but not everything is a punishment. Just because you may be going through a time of prosperity and somebody else is going through a time of difficulty doesn't make you any better or any worse than the other individual. What makes the difference is that who is Christ in your life? Who is Christ in your home? Who is Christ in your situation? That will be the determining factor. So when you give unto the Lord, we give free, freely. We give willfully. We give, we give joyfully. That's how we give unto the Lord. And when we live our life, we do the same. Live with a grateful heart, a thankful heart, a giving heart. Because when we do that, the Lord is the sustainer of everything. Hallelujah. So Pastor Conda and I, as we come to the end of the service now, we'll be standing at the front. I'll dismiss the service. But if anybody needs us to lay hands on them, to pray with them, we'll be here at the front. Okay? If you've heard the message and you've moved away from God, brothers and sisters, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. So if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to come down, we're going to lay hands on you, we're going to pray with you, and we'll minister to you, and then we have a beautiful gift to give to you to help you on this journey with Christ Jesus. Right, so I will dismiss the service now, and then all of those can come to the front who need it, and we'll pray and minister with you. Amen? Hallelujah. One last announcement I didn't mention. I have Pastor Henna and Pastor Lauren here. They've recently moved from Johannesburg, Pretoria, down here to Durban. They will be uh, taking over um, Rhema Church in Ilovo, all right? That's in Amanzim Toti, all right? So they've come. Thank you so much for being here. It's wonderful to have you. Come, let's give them a hand. Hallelujah. I haven't known you for a long time, but it seems like we've known each other for a very, very long time. And they just have such a wonderful heart for, for God's house. And they have such a passion for the things of God. It's just amazing. And I believe you guys are going to be, um, you know, very influential in that city. And God's going to use you all mightily. Amen. Hallelujah. So I'll dismiss the service. And for all those that want prayer, please come down. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we close the service and as we go out into the world, Father, I plead the blood over every mind, over every heart every soul, every family, every situation in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord God, that as they go to sleep, Lord God, that you will give them the answers. As they go home, Father, you will give them the victory. Lord, as they start to work with the principles that you've put in your word, Lord, let them see the light at the end of the tunnel. Let them see the light uh, burn out the darkness. Lord, let them see victory in every area of their life. Let them see the increase. For those that have sown their first fruits going forward 2024, Lord God, let this be a relentless year for them. Lord, that they will see you move in mighty ways, miraculous ways in the name of Jesus. As they go out, give them safe traveling mercies, protect them. 
in their workplace, protect them in their home, protect them, the kids in the school, protect the kids in the university, in the mighty name of Jesus. Let every situation at home be rectified. Let every relationship be restored. Lord, give them victory and peace in every area in Jesus' mighty name. And God's people said, Amen. God bless you. We'll see you for discipleship class on Wednesday. Amen.